everyone. Welcome to One Plus One. I'm June Oscar, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner. Ngende jumoi ngirangu bono bayano boundo boundo. Karu angende jalulurara muai nenge panda nenge jalungoro karu angende ye. We are here at Moundo Moundo, a place on Bunaba country. This water flowing comes from the earth. It is good water, and this is Bunaba country. June Oscar, welcome to One Plus One. Thank you, Dan. We're here on your country, Bunaba country at Yiramalai near Fitzroy Crossing. To get here though, you've got to fly to Broome. Then you drive about four hours from there. It's a long way from anywhere. Why is this country so important? Well, this is the country of Bunaba people. We've occupied this area since the beginning of time. We have our whole history, our ancestors, our families have raised generations of families out on this country. This country is what gives meaning to the lives of Bunaba people. This is the language that we speak that comes from this country. This is the country that we've defended through um, Jandamara and the Bonobo resistance back in the 1800s. This is the place uh, where our heart belongs. When you're home here and, and you're back where that heart belongs, tell me what does that, what does it feel like? What does it do for your soul, for your spirit? Oh, coming back into country just means I can leave the rest of the world and all the busyness of that behind and it re-energises me to continue to um, confront the issues that I have to deal with um, on a daily basis in, you know, in the outside world. And as the Social Justice Commissioner, it's wonderful for me to have a place to escape to. On the way out here, we, we pass through a spectacular range, a, a reef, if you will, and also a, a boab tree that I understand was very special, was special to you and particularly to your mum and your grandma. Can you tell me about that? Now, you would have seen Gulerinyi um, Karwa. My grandmother went hunting on that ridge with my mother as a young woman or a child. They'd stop there and they knew water was within the trunk of that boab. My grandmother cut into the trunk of the boab with her axe to make a little ladder so she could climb up and get water from there. And water is still held there. We see birds dipping in and out. But my mother told me the story of um, you know, waiting at the base of it to get water when they were out there hunting. And that ridge has a lot of fruit, a lot of meat um, that my family would hunt. You've talked about the, the power of story and of connection here. There's also a really painful history as well, isn't there? This is a place that you describe, where you describe your grandmother as a survivor. What do you mean by that? Well, my mother, her mother and my grandmother's sisters and extended family, you know, they were born during the time of the resistance against white settlement into Bonoba country, led by Jandamara, who was, um, you know, a Bonoba man. If you were a white person, a white man, you were given full authority to shoot Aboriginal people. So up here it's known as the killing times, and these are the frontier wars that um, our people lived through. Bonobo people were killed um, throughout Bonobo country at the time of that resistance. There's places in Bonobo country where there's mass burials, there's graves, there's human remains. 
um, in through our country, through the Oscar Rangers, through the Napier Rangers. Um, and so that's real. That That's, you know, that's our reality. You mentioned Jandamara, renowned story around these parts. Tell me, tell me about him. Well, this is the country that Jandamara uh, defended. He lived and worked and travelled through here. And um, we also know not just from the Bunaba um, oral history, but we also see that in the police diaries. Police wrote about him and recorded where he was, where they were. Pastoralists um, wrote about him. Governments wrote about him on the, you know, during the time. And June, that resistance still continues through the generations, doesn't it? Your grandma refused for your mum to be taken to the settler's school. That's right. My mother told me the story of um, her wanting to join with other family members who were um, attending the mission school uh, and my grandmother going up to her and saying, get away from that place, you don't need to go there. Um, I will teach you everything you need to know. Um, I don't trust white people. That's what my grandmother told my mother um, and that's why my mother um, said she didn't have the opportunity to attend the mission school. But my mother um, held such knowledge, you know, depth and vast knowledge of the world of the Bonoba. And my grandmother and my mother were my teachers. How much of that did they pass on to you as you were walking in both worlds, really? Well, everything I know and the confidence I have in my identity was taught to me by them. Uh, June, right now in Fitzroy Crossing, there are lots of different Aboriginal communities, language groups. Well, has that always been the case? Different language groups in Fitzroy um, have come to live in Fitzroy from when um, the missions and the police started to, to establish themselves here. And from the killing times, people sought refuge at the mission with the missionaries. And then later, when we had, uh, after the 67 referendum and the equal wages um, decision, which meant that pastoralists had to now pay Aboriginal people for their labour, we saw a lot of uh, Aboriginal people trucked off the pastoral properties, which sits on their traditional lands, um, people brought into Fitzroy and dumped in Fitzroy, and that gave rise to a whole group of, um, you know, five language groups living um, at the southernmost point of Bonoba country, um, which is where the town is built now. And people lived um, in separate areas according to which language group they belonged to. And, and the people in the middle were the, the mediators that would um, manage the traffic and, and the communications between the language group. And I, I you know, recall watching that cultural authority of very senior people, men and women, manage us all living in a confined space at the mission camp, uh, which was, you know, small, akin to a refugee camp. And as a kid growing up in that setting, we had the opportunity to see uh, cultural leadership in full flight. Uh, June, you went away to Perth for high school and, and I think you came a little bit closer back to Derby for a job when you had a light bulb moment. Tell me about that story. Oh, I came back to Derby and did some relief work with the Aboriginal Legal Services of Western Australia. I think I was about 19 years of age then. Um, and as I was preparing court documents for the solicitor then, I realised that what I was typing was a real injustice. 
um, and that Aboriginal people can, um, you know, seek justice through the courts, through the Western courts. So it was there that I realised this is wonderful that we can trust a system um, to uphold our rights, to defend our rights. From seeing that those rights protected in that frame, you went on to do a whole range of jobs, including ATSEC Commissioner, the Women's Resource Centre CEO in Fitzroy Crossing, Kimberley Language Resource Centre Chair, uh, and the key feature uh, uh, that, and that common thread that runs through your CV seems to be about affecting and creating real change. Well, firstly, I, um, for me, it is about our right to be who we are as Indigenous people. So I became really aware at a very young age that um, my role and my contribution as a young person alongside of um, the cultural authority of my elders at the time was to, to be um, a useful tool within that setting and be at the interface where it was my responsibility to make sure my elders understood what was being said, what was being requested of them, what was the impact for them. So um, it was clear to me that was my role. I enjoyed um, working in that space. I stayed within community development and social justice um, from that early light bulb moment with the West Australian Aboriginal Legal Service in Derby. This is Fitzroy Crossing in the boom state of Western Australia. Alcohol has cut such a destructive path through the Aboriginal community here that the West Australian coroner is investigating 20 deaths in the region, all believed to be related to drinking. This week sees the start of a six-month ban on all takeaway alcohol bar light beer, an act demanded by the community. Well, I think it's been at a real crisis point for quite some time and the decision to take some drastic action has had to happen sooner rather than later. Fitzroy Crossing, your home is now a dry town, which came about through your work to try and stop fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. In fact, that's where I first interviewed you about 15 years ago. It feels like much longer than that. Just remind me, what, what pushed and prompted you to have that focus? Um, there were several things. There was the issue of um, the 50 deaths in one year, preventable deaths. Alcohol was a large part of it. You know, the impact of that, that the Fitzroy Valley was in a rut of grief and loss and sadness. It was very, very troubling times. And that families were grieving, but families were also carrying this parenting responsibility of children with behaviours that many of the great grandmothers had never seen before. So these were children being born who had been exposed to alcohol in utero. And the result of that, when the child was attending school, that there were so many children that were being sent home or expelled for bad behaviour or what was termed unacceptable and bad behaviour. So many children talked about having the red card and being sent from class to the principal's office. And, you know, we thought our children can't all be this bad in this many numbers. Um, we also had really listened to the grandmothers around how they were responding to meeting the needs and, and um, 
protecting and, and, and caring for these children. And many of the grandmothers, great-grandmothers were saying, we have to address alcohol. So it was urgent. And so that was when in um, July of 2007, we met out at Mingalgala uh, in Guniandi country and women gave me the instructions to take this matter up with the West Australian Liquor Licensing Commission. And so we wrote to the Liquor Licensing Authority um, requesting um, a moratorium on the sale of full strength alcohol and spirits to our community of about three and a half, four thousand people. What impact did that decision and that change have on the safety and well-being of, of children? So we were successful in, in having restrictions imposed um, into our community. We were then able to focus on the situation of our children. We were able to respond to their medical needs immediately and their educational needs. And what was the reaction in the community more broadly? Oh, there's, um, you know, opposition to... Str the strong decision. opposition, if I remember. Very strong opposition. We, you know, received threats. We, you know, had um, people, you know, say they were going to do things to us. Um, culturally and, and, you know, it meant that we, you know, we couldn't um, go down and have a meal at the lodge or the crossing in because um, people, you know, would attack you or, you know, pick an argument with you. Um, there were, you know, businessmen that, um, you know, told me to pull my head in and, you know, what, what, um, what did I think I was doing and to stop shit stirring. Wow. How did you withstand that? How, how do you forge through such vitriolic opposition and just go, I'm going to keep going, I'm, I'm going to forge ahead? Well, there was one clear answer for me and it was because the children are worth fighting for. It's pretty powerful. Simple. It's clear that, that so much of your work has been driven by hearing and listening to the voices of women. I think the Bonobo word is Winyuara. Uh, this is something that's become central, really, to your work as social justice commissioner. In this role, you've also tried to tackle institutional and systemic racism that we've heard a little bit about, but that you've spoken about very publicly throughout your entire life. Do you think the dial has moved on that? Well, I'd like to think so, but we continue to hear, um, you know, the, the stories around this country of the experiences of Indigenous people with um, governments, with agencies, with businesses, um, and the discrimination is still there the over-surveillance of um, Aboriginal people in shopping centres, the over-representation of our young people and our older, you know, adults in the prison systems, the rates of removal of our children into child protection um, care, the victimisation of parents and caregivers where there's no support to respond and prevent uh, some of these incidences, it's still happening. I hope together that we can, um, you know, really eradicate the, the levels in, of racism and discrimination where they exist. But to do that, we need to ensure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the Indigenous people of this country, are at the decision-making table to ensure that happens in the right way. For decades, you've called for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to be at decision-making tables, to have 
voices heard, to be listened to and to be respected. Right now we're having a national conversation about a voice to parliament. You've been part of some of the advisory groups that are working with the federal government around the parameters, what it might look like and what it could do. What sort of a difference do you think such a body could have made or could make in Australia? Well, I think it would be a body that would be so enabling, would provide a mechanism for Australia to make informed decisions around the issues that impact Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It would mean that we've reached a point of maturity, of courage as Australians that we are capable of achieving to ensure that our voices are informing those who are making decisions about matters that affect our lives on a daily basis. We don't need politicians to be using our right to have a say in matters that affect our lives and the quality of life that we can have in our country as a political football. So we need to ask Australian people to remove that opportunity from them, from using it as a political football, because this is not about politics and politics alone. Our right to a voice is above the politics. This is about our human rights. We want a right to be able to advise and inform and make those decisions because we can see and we know from our lived reality other people making decisions about our lives just haven't worked. June, you've just returned here to Bunaba country from New York where you were there in an official role as the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner. But you've also spent a lot of time here throughout the floods that have really captured, at times, the nation's attention. How's the town and the community doing? Well, it's taking um, its toll on people uh, individually and collectively to uh, make sense of their situation, to come to terms with what just happened. Uh, we're river country people, so we understand and look forward to the flooding each year. Uh, when it does happen, it has a, um, you know, the significance of the flood is um, that it cleanses the country, it replenishes the water holes and, um, you know, food that we fish and hunt and, and gather. So that's something that we look forward to each year. But this year the river behaved very differently and the flooding took so many homes from people. It's displaced so many. Uh, and in my case, my house is going to be demolished because the flood went right through there. So it's been absolutely frustrating because there's been so many um, people at different layers of the bureaucracy coming in and having conversations with people in community. I've heard that from community people, that they just really feel like they're not being heard. June, I know that you care for a grandchild and a great-grandchild as well through kinship uh, caring. How important is it for them to have a strong grounding in ancestral, those ancient stories, some of which you've shared with, with me today? Oh, it's absolutely important. Um, I'm carrying the responsibility now as the senior um, female in my family and I have a huge responsibility to ensure my great-granddaughter um, knows who she is knows that she has responsibility for country, knows where she comes from, where her ancestors are from, hears her language. So it's, um, you know, really wonderful and, and joyful to know that 
we are continuing to be um, survived by these um, new generations of family members. Um, it's so important because the country needs us to remain connected, to um, protect it, to speak for it, because the country speaks through us, through the people who belong to it, to protect it. Well, June, you, you have spent your life fighting for equality for Boonaba people, for all Indigenous people in Australia. Do you think that that is a fight that will be left to your great-granddaughter that you're caring for and for other others that are just children now? Well, I hope that um, they don't have the fight on some of the things that we can resolve now. Um, I hope that they don't have to fight, that they can enjoy what this country and the world has to offer, that they can live in a world that um, they know they won't be discriminated against, that, that they can experience non-discrimination, that they can experience the freedom of that. That's the future that I want to see for all our children and all our grandchildren. But it takes the courage of now, the responsibility of us now to ensure that future. June, you're highly respected in your Bunaba community nationally and globally as well. What does being an elder mean to you? Oh, I don't know if I'm that old yet. <laughs> hey, no shade. <laughs> um, I think, you know, it's an absolute honour to be acknowledged uh, as a, you know, older person in my community. I've welcomed, you know, being 61 and uh, what that means in terms of responsibility, knowledge um, and particularly responsibility in carrying out the, the wishes of um, my mother, my grandmother, my people, and ensuring that their words are still listened to. It's so important to me that our young people continue to speak our language. That's when country comes alive because it hears its language. That's when the spirits of our ancestors are right there with us because they can hear their language being spoken and is still alive today and into the future. So being at my age, I'm, I'm welcoming, you know, this stage of my life um, with open arms and I'm enjoying this, this stage of my life. June Oscar, thank you for joining me on One Plus One. Thank you very much.